So when you chant, let my people go, that's actually really offensive to me. Because you don't actually want peace. You, you just want to wipe all Egyptians off the map, right? You just want to exterminate all Egyptians? How am I supposed to take your movement seriously when you have these violent chants? How am I, as an Egyptian, supposed to hear that and not be offended? Let my people go. How dare you? Countries, how long is your police training? We make sure our police is well trained, so 4,500 hours. Oh, same thing, 4,500 hours. Oh, same number for me, 4,500. That's, that's a reasonable amount. Well, not for us, it's only 4,000. 4,000 is enough hours? Like, you're missing 500 hours compared to the other countries. Yeah, I think that's good enough. Oh, we only train our police 2,250 hours. Okay, that's way less than the other countries. Yeah, but our police is doing well. Yeah, for us, it's 2,080 hours. And is your police doing as well? I don't know, maybe, maybe they should get a few more hours. Yeah, we only train our police for 672 hours. That's it? Buddy, that's way too low. What? That explains a lot. New report confirmed that younger Americans only vote for, quote, things they believe in. Here's why that's a problem. Delusional hit and run victim claims driver was, quote, dressed like a police officer. We fact-checked the claim that American-made missiles were used in an attack on a hospital and found it false. American-made missiles were used in an attack on part of a hospital. Thousands of health workers are striking for better wages and benefits. This professor says they just might not feel guilty enough. This company's approach to homelessness involves electronic water fountains and the same amount of homeless people. Meet Dr. Doofenshmirtz, the misunderstood genius who's proving that scientists can have fun too. That was an awesome conference, right? Mm, except all the black women were lighter than a paper bag. Don't be a hater. At least black women are winning. But if they're all light-skinned, then not all black women are winning. Colorism is the social marginalization and systemic oppression of people with darker skin tones and the privileging of people with lighter skin tones. This happens within and across race, ethnicity, region, and culture. Like futurism and texturism, colorism is a product of white supremacy, colonization, classism, and casteism. Oh, colorism. Mm -hmm. I've experienced that. You benefit from it. Actually, it goes both ways. Actually... It does not. Just like there's no such thing as reverse racism, there's no such thing as reverse colorism. There are people who benefit from colorism, lighter skinned folks, at the expense of those who are harmed by colorism, darker skinned folks. Institutional colorism means that medical devices are not designed to work well on darker skin tones. Medical imagery and models routinely erase darker skinned people. Darker skinned black people are 30% more likely to be incarcerated or criminalized due to colorism. And because of colorism, people with darker skin tones are less likely to be featured in film, TV, and advertising. Conversations around colorism should be led by the people who are harmed by it, AKA dark skin folks. I launched Colorism Healing in 2013 to dig deeper and facilitate solutions. You can learn more at colorismhealing.com. Smarter in seconds. I hear people saying, oh, don't worry, history will remember, we're on the right side of history and we'll realize in the future. But history is written by the winners. It's manipulated and shaped to be whatever the people in power want us to believe. So no, it's not a guarantee that history will remember the genocide of Palestine if the same systems of power are allowed to stay in place. There's been dozens of massacres over the past few decades for imperialistic purposes that have been completely erased in history. Look up Operation Condor or the coups in Guatemala, in Chile, in Indonesia, um, the US invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, um, even the genocide of Native Americans. There's been no accountability or no reckoning by the US at all. Even in Palestine, one of the reasons Israel has so much legitimacy right now is because of the erasure of history, because of memoricide, which means literally depriving people on their own land of their own history. Back when the Nakba happened, Zionists renamed many Palestinian Arab geographical sites to give them Hebrew biblical names, to give more legitimacy to the Israeli state and basically erase thousands of years of history. There's been a systematic uprooting of Palestinians' olive trees because they symbolize a connection with the land. So if we want history to remember this, then we cannot stay silent. Staying silent means allowing the oppressors to continue to rewrite history however they want. If we want the US and Israel to be held accountable, then we have to keep fighting until there's a free Palestine, until there's a free Sudan, until there's a free Congo. Otherwise, history will write over it and allow the cycles of violence to keep happening again and again. 
So Israel is now collaborating with multiple social media platforms in order to censor what is being posted. They're clearly worried about the opposition they're facing, which means that now more than ever, we cannot let up. Keep posting about it, even if you have to be a little more careful with the language you're using. I encourage you to save or download to your phone any videos with information that you think is worth remembering. Please continue to contact your representatives and please continue boycotting. This week, especially with Black Friday coming up in America, y'all boycott the hell out of those companies, okay? By the way, here is the official list of companies to avoid supporting. If you can make it to one, there are protests happening all over the world, and even if there isn't one near you, honestly, just start your own. Even if you're the only person there, it still makes a difference. Why the fuck do the worst people come- When I tell you I've been waiting my whole life to answer this question. Like, I've been in social activism for over 10 years, and then recently found myself in places like this, getting really proximate to power, and understanding how it works, and why, from the outside, so many powerful people seem to be just, like, doing terrible things. And for today, I'm going to focus on capitalism, because that's kind of what I've seen the most of, but there's a lot to say. I feel like we have to really understand who this person is, and how they end up becoming so powerful. It can be really tempting to look at capitalism as like a fixed system, but in fact the answer lies in how they get there and who they become along the way. And I'm going to talk about the average person, who typically has some element of privilege, whether that's in terms of their money, their parents, their education, their network, which is priming their success in a capitalist world and also like shaping their sort of baseline inclinations about the world. This average person, let's say, does not have parents who are interested in social justice. They're probably part of capitalist worlds themselves or somewhat disillusioned by non-capitalist spaces. So this privilege ultimately serves as a foundation for getting into like a good school, which in my opinion is where a lot of the capitalist conditioning actually happens. It's worth noting that a lot of people actually begin by studying stuff like political science or economics or history only to never pursue work in that area. I think it suggests that there is an element of curiosity and optimism when you're like 18 or 19, which soon dies out. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is the fact that when you're about to graduate, you're basically getting presented with a very narrow set of options. It's usually stuff like consulting, banking, or tech that come to recruit as a And these places don't just sell you like the dream around money and status. They in fact paint it as a very no-brainer choice to join these companies because they focus a lot on the kind of learning and the skills that you're going to develop in these areas. It's also painted as a very no-brainer choice for the reason that you can do it for a few years and then go off to do something else. Or at least that's what they say. Especially in contrast to like non-profits and politics and stuff like that, right? Like those things are painted as slow and poorly paid and you're basically told that you can kind of do them later. What this does is lure a large number of people who may not have pursued capitalist jobs to get into them. The next step is that once you're in these jobs, I think it's very easy to forget just how much they shape your reality. Not only are you spending a bunch of time in these places, you're also now becoming part of a cultural class that does things a certain way. So whether that's your friends, your clothes, like what you do on the weekend, everything begins to slowly shift as you spend just a sheer amount of time at these places. Let's not forget that you're also like 21 to 25, which is a very formative time to be kind of like building your identity and your early conception about the world itself. And this leads to what I like to call alternate realities. It's easy to forget that in the world that we live in, you can literally live down the road from someone who's poor, struggling to make ends meet, and literally have no idea what their conception of reality is actually like. Same with like trillionaires who have private jets and yachts, or everybody in the middle. Because once you begin to occupy that space, everything you do is suddenly very different and very insular. So the media you consume, the social media you have, the obviously levels of income, your clothes, who you're dating, your family, like your For You page, like literally everything about the life you live begins to occupy this world. And what that does is that it shifts the parameters and reference points for what is good and bad. Because each world has a set of norms and incentives about what it considers good behavior and bad behavior. So in the case of a capitalist space, you often find that what is prized is stuff like having a good life, taking care of yourself and your family, prizing logic and intelligence and rationality as like superior qualities, money naturally, as opposed to things like being too emotional about things or caring too much for the oppressed or for social justice. At the same time, it's really important to note that a lot of these things are rationalized and accommodated within capitalism. So you might, for example, be on the board of an NGO while still making a trillion bucks. Like that might be a rational way to think and conceive of your social impact on the world. Or you might be able to find a business that is kind of doing good while not compromising on your quality of life. And lastly, you're going to care a lot about your image and kind of how people perceive you and what your social networks are. Like I can't stress how important this ends up becoming. So this is what we're working with. Like these are the things that are considered valuable in a capitalist space. You're constantly getting signals from the world around you that this is what you should be optimizing for in your life over stuff like this. It's very subtle, but very insidious how how much this kind of schema about the world ends up basically being internalized by the people themselves. 
even if you're a good person, I've noticed that people are generally like well-meaning but tend to be quite lazy in questioning these things. They're going to rely on everything that is inbound to kind of tell them what is good and bad. And to some extent, I think we're all like this, right? Like we're all following trends and kind of looking at people we admire and looking away from people we don't admire. And that is always going to be contextualized in a social sense. However, I think when you have that much privilege and power, it's crazy that you can just disconnect from realities that you should probably care about. Because finally, let's see what happens when we have situations like today where you have a massive crisis, you have a genocide that is piercing this world quite strongly. So you're getting an element of dissonant information that is making you question like, are these norms actually good? What is my role in places like this? And should I be rethinking it? This is like creating some contradiction within the world you occupy. At the same time, although it wakes up some people, the majority of people still continue to like be apathetic or neutral or side with whatever their friends are saying. Like, even though you're aware there's a crisis, everything you receive about it is going to be filtered through the people and media in this world. There is a veil, a narrative that is going to be painted upon this thing that's going to prevent you from looking at the situation in the way that you and I might be looking at it. And to cope with that, you're also going to be engaging in some storytelling and some rationalizing and labeling. So when you hear about someone who's like pro-Palestine, you might think, oh, well, they're a lefty, they're woke. Like, you'll create this separation that says, I am not like them. Or you might say, well, there are other people in power who have way more influence over the situation, so I'm okay. Like, people will go to great lengths just to avoid that discomfort. Lastly, we have to remember that even though the information is coming in, it's still a minority of the kind of signals that you're being sent from this world. Like if 95% of people are still having brunch and living a normal life, you're gonna think that is a normal response given these are my values. Also, it's worth pointing out that throughout this journey, you're never really told to like value your inherent worth as an individual. So you're constantly borrowing it based on external attributes. So even when these situations happen, you're still looking for like, what is my value in this world as opposed to look at how much power I have and what I can do with it. And so you end up normalizing and upholding a very oppressive system and being complicit in stuff that, that maybe a version of you before would have said no to. No, I'm fine with the LGBT. I just can't get behind that pronoun shit. The pronouns. Oh, don't play dumb. You know that pronoun shit, they, they, that made up shit. <laughs> pronouns aren't made up. It is really awesome you think gay people as a whole invented a very important thing of the English language. <laughs> it is made up. I don't have pronouns. My mom doesn't have pronouns. My friends don't have pronouns. We didn't have pronouns till gay people came along. Okay? Your mom, how is he? How's your mom? Is he okay? Is your mom okay? Is he good? You trying to piss me off? My mom's a woman. A woman? She? <laughs> okay, that's a pronoun. That's a pronoun. They, it, we are pronouns. This is stuff we learned in first grade, man. Like, I don't know what to tell you. If I called you she, you'd blow a fuse because you know your pronouns. You're just being homophobic. Hope that helps. Wait till they realize saying they don't have pronouns is ultimately the most trans thing they can say. I'm the reason they call it bikinis bottom. Don't forget I left you on red, gang. The baddest bitches live in bubbles, that's a fucking fact. Ain't no patty, bitches crabby, I got hella ass. I bought my strap into the club, I'm trying to throw it back. And I just hit up Danger, he a pussy, don't know how to act. Mm -hmm. Did you know before 1492, an estimated 100 million people called the Americas home? It's your favorite land back fatty. And let's talk about the Native American Holocaust and how it's relevant today. It's hard to pinpoint the exact population, but according to some, an upwards of 100 million made up the Western Hemisphere, with 5 million living in what is now the continental US. By the year 1900, the US Native population had decreased to 250,000, so it's estimated that over the course of 400 years, 5 million native people were killed in the conquest for US land. False, harmful narratives were also created to aid such atrocities. Native peoples were shown as savages in order to dehumanize them and condone settler brutality. European settlers also used religion to justify their actions. For many, it was God's manifest destiny that allowed the violent theft of land. Women, children, and elders were often targeted as a means to gain control if not by settlers, later by mercenaries. Once total annihilation was no longer an option, the violent act of assimilation and erasure began. Erasure is a reality we still face today, not only from a historical viewpoint, but from the workplace, schools, and mainstream media. This becomes relevant as we begin to see history repeat itself in places like Palestine, Sudan, and the Congo, where violent acts of genocide occur every day. 
Happy Native American Heritage Month. One of the arguments that I keep hearing against a ceasefire is the idea that there was a ceasefire on October the 7th that was all of a sudden broken. But I think I must not understand what a ceasefire really is, because this year the State of Israel has not been behaving like there was a ceasefire. In June of this year, they used an Apache attack helicopter in the Janine refugee camp in the West Bank, where there is no Hamas. There are resistance fighters there. However, Israel led a full-on military invasion of the camp earlier this year, destroying so much of it. So what ceasefire are people actually talking about? Because I seem to not understand it. And there are many other incidents like this. By October the 5th of this year, already 200 Palestinians had been killed by Israeli fire. The majority of these were done by Israeli soldiers, like two-year-old Mohammed Al-Tamimi, who was killed by an Israeli soldier who has still not been reprimanded for killing a child. Or you had other examples like Kusai Mutan, a 19-year-old who was murdered by two extremist Israeli settlers who received the punishment of first of all house arrest and then being banned from entering the West Bank for six months. These people committed cold-blooded murder and got away with it. Here's a photo of one of the perpetrators literally smiling because he knows that the Israeli court does not want to convict him. Extremist Israeli settlers have also been carrying out pogroms all year in order to ethnically cleanse Palestinian towns whilst also being supported by the Israeli military. Plus 972 magazine published this article about ethnic cleansing in the Jordan Valley and you can look to examples of towns like Tura Messiah which experienced a pogrom with over a hundred armed Israeli settlers attacking the town and also Hawara that has been under constant attack but especially on one specific date. It was attacked on October the 6th, when we are meant to believe that there was a ceasefire, extremist Israeli settlers entered the town of Hawara with the support of the army, and they smashed it up, they murdered a Palestinian, and then afterwards, one of the extremist Israeli politicians, Zvi Sukkot, and all of his friends sat down and had a meal at the table in order to mock Palestinians. In 2018, Israel enshrined settlement as a national value, and settling Palestinian territory is illegal under international law and it is frowned upon by the international community because ultimately territorial expansionism taking people's land brings with it violence as it always has historically so how can you seriously tell me that israel was really adhering to a ceasefire when they've been doing pogroms ethnic cleansing cold-blooded murder all year the only way that you can believe this is if you don't know anything about palestine or don't read any news about it this is just your reminder, instead of using AI, you should commission your local artist. If you want to see Hello Kitty and Sonic interact together, you should commission your local artist. If you want to see Supergirl fly in front of the Empire State Building, you should commission your local artist. If you want to see Sakura smoking a pack, you should commission your local artist. If you want to see Fluttershy skateboarding, you should commission your local artist. If you want to see Batman, you should... Did you know the first non-white player in the NBA was Asian American? No, he wasn't. Yes, he was. No, he wasn't. Yes, he was. Who was the first non-white athlete to break the color barrier and play in the NBA? Well, back then it was called the Basketball Association of America. But it's true. Asian American athlete Wataru Wat Masako was the first in 1947. And which team did he play for? The New York Knicks. So this may surprise you, but e-bikes are having a much larger impact on improving the environment than electric cars. I didn't realize this, and this is a pretty staggering number, but there are already 280 million e-bikes and like electric mopeds and those kind of vehicles already on the road. They're already lowering demand for oil by four times as much as electric cars. Their sheer popularity is already cutting demand for oil by a million barrels of oil a day, about 1% of the world's total oil demand. The beauty of e-bikes is that they use so little energy to transport one person compared to like an electric vehicle transporting one person to work. If you could commute by e-bike 20 kilometers a day, your annual cost would be $20. The cost of entry for an e-bike is so accessible compared to a car. You can get a good e-bike these days for $1,000 or like $1,200. They're very low maintenance and like we just saw, it costs very little to charge and run them. It would be much cheaper for you and much better for the environment for you to commute by e-bike compared to a standard 
electric vehicle. But if your commute is too far to use an e-bike, it would still be a huge improvement if you could use an e-bike to get around town for small errands, going grocery shopping, stuff like that. If you currently have a gas car, probably the single best thing you could do for the environment is to buy an e-bike and to use it in place of your gas car whenever possible. And that would have a bigger impact than buying an electric vehicle. Partially because building an e-bike and manufacturing it has a much lower carbon footprint than building and manufacturing an electric vehicle. Because the popular perception is that replacing your car with an electric is just this huge win for the environment, but it's not really that impactful compared to some of the other things that you can do. And you can see down here, not having a car and you could probably use a bike instead is three times more effective than replacing your car with an electric car or hybrid. Also interesting that the thing most perceived as having a good impact on the environment is recycling and it has one of the lowest impacts on this list. But that's probably the subject of an entirely separate video. I like to ask my kids for performance reviews. A while ago, one of my kids was super grumpy towards me. And I mean, over the smallest things, like I could say the wrong word and she would snap at me. And I was really confused by this. So when we were both in good moods, I sat down to talk to her. And I asked her my two favorite performance review questions. One being, is there anything I'm doing that's bothering you? And two being, is there anything you need that I'm not doing? And she thought about that for a moment before saying, no, not that I can think of. And I said, okay, I hear you. However, it feels like there's a problem based on the way our interactions have been going recently and I can't fix a problem that I don't know about. She said, yeah, I mean, it's not like a problem though. You're not doing anything wrong. I just find myself getting frustrated with you really quickly recently. And I said, yeah, I could tell, but based on your age and the fact that I'm your mom, that tracks. I said, if you do think of something, I am all ears, but in the meantime, I need you to be more mindful of how you're speaking to me. I understand being annoyed with mom for no apparent reason, but I have feelings too, and I'm not cool with how you've been treating me when you're feeling that way. Anyway, sometimes I ask those questions in response to a behavior I'm noticing, while other times I ask the questions at random times just to check in. The other day, I asked one of my other kids if she thought there was anything I should work on or change, and she said the only thing she would change about me is this arm, because it doesn't have tattoos like the rest of me. My kids don't often have criticism for me, but I continue to ask so they have a safe space to share it if they do, because when they have, it's helped me become a better parent for them. Okay, bye. I think about this all the time, and I don't know if I'm crazy, I'm not, but it's safe to say that we can see a lot of instances when we really think about it of directors mostly male directors putting their like sick fantasies or whatever into their movies for instance i know a lot of people have talked about this before but megan is missing when that movie was trending back in 2020 i watched it with my friends i wish i never watched it because first of all it was just a terrible movie it was so bad and there were also so many unnecessary scenes and and things in there that that just did not need to be in there and I think people eventually suspected the director as like a creep because like oh oh that movie is just so it was terrible or a more recent topic um this isn't a movie but Yandere Simulator like I used to actually be a pretty big fan of the game me and my friends really liked it when we were younger but like no shit that a guy who made a game about anime girls sexualizing young anime girls and like murdering them and stuff was mm, into young women and probably into way way more really creepy shit i know there was like some like weird things found on his um like history and stuff and there are tons and tons and tons of other movies that i haven't mentioned that are just the same as this and i just mm, i think it's so weird and i hate it and it makes me feel so icky and we should call it out more and don't you start with that oh but it's realism bullshit with me because scenes like these bad violent scenes or whatever against women sure they can be used to like tell a story and thing and stuff but like ones that go so far and that are so long there are some and some movies that are just so long and unnecessary it seriously is just disgusting and it rubs me the wrong way completely 
And if you want to talk about realism, how come women in zombie apocalypse movies or whatever don't have any body hair on them? But you think, oh, but a five minute domestic abuse scene is really realistic. We need to get that in there. Like, don't give me that bullshit. Like, I can't, I don't. For instance, one time I was watching a movie and it started to trudge into some kind of dark topics. I could just, I already felt what was coming and my friend had watched it before and I asked him, hey, are there any like SA scenes or anything like that in this movie? Because I might just walk away for a bit because I don't really want to watch that. It was just a really sensitive time in my life and he knew that. And instead of saying yes or no, he told me that I was stupid and immature for not being able to watch or stomach things like that because like that whole spiel how, about how like it was for realism and blah 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 basically just degrading me for not wanting to watch something of that topic it, it was insane I don't know I don't know how I like let that happen anyway sorry I could talk about this forever because it really grinds my gears and yeah but that's all I have to say